Hello and welcome. Seen as a threat to many Arab regimes, artists and intellectuals were often repressed. So what role can they play now as the landscape changes through popular uprisings? Many of those challenging their long-standing authoritarian regimes say they've been inspired by the literature of protests through the years. From Latin America to the Arab world, writers and thinkers have faced persecution and even death for daring to speak out against totalitarian rule, but their persistence has served as an example for those seeking change. So today we ask, what is the political power of literature and what role do writers and artists have in social revolutions? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. You can send an SMS or an email, and we also welcome your phone calls on the show. Joining me now from London is Libyan writer Hisham Matar, who spent his early childhood in Tripoli until his family were forced to flee the Gaddafi regime. In 1990, his father, a political dissident, was kidnapped in Cairo and remains missing to this day. His book, In the Country of Men, tells the story of Colonel Gaddafi's 1969 September Revolution through the eyes of a nine-year-old boy. Also with us is internationally acclaimed Egyptian writer Adaf Suef. She has recently returned to London after participating in the Tahrir Square protests in Egypt. Her book, The Map of Love, traces modern Egyptian history. And from Durham in North Carolina, we're joined by the world-renowned Chilean writer Ariel Dorfman. In the 1960s, he took part in the social revolutions that swept Latin America, and he worked as a cultural advisor to Chilean President Salvador Allende. Professor Dorfman was forced into exile during the authoritarian Pinochet regime. And his play, Death and the Maiden, about torture and disappearance, has been staged around the world. I thank you all for being on the show. And Hisham Matra, actually, I'd like to start with you, if I may, and, and ask, considering how the, uh, the Gaddafi regime has affected your family, how do you regard what's, what's going on in Libya and, and what might really change there when it comes to the, the social landscape? Well, what's going on in Libya right now is extraordinary because the Libyan dictatorship has been in, you know, exceptionally violent and oppressive. Uh, cultural life in Libya under Gaddafi has been all but decimated. And obviously, you know, witnessing this uprising, I'm more concerned right now with, with the loss of life and with the vulnerability that Libyan society finds itself in. But also, I am also excited, if that's the right word, about the future, hopeful about the future. Let me ask you, do and you feel it seems um, that yeah, do you feel that there will really be a change in the way people can express themselves? Do you really feel I mean no one really knows what's going to happen next. Do you feel there will be greater freedom of expression? Well, I think so because I think the most significant thing that has happened in these last few weeks, uh, not only in Libya, obviously, but also in Tunisia and in Egypt, hasn't been what people have focused on, which is the toppling of you know, long-standing, uh, incredibly uh, violent, oppressive dictatorships, although that's, of course, an incredibly significant event. I think what has been uh, more significant is that I get the sense that people in Tunisia and in Egypt and now in Libya are rediscovering what it means to be a people. They're rediscovering their national identity, the sense of themselves certain kind of, right. um, you know, regaining of a, a sort of pride and, uh, you know, a sense of what it means to live in a metropolis. And so I think inevitably that's going to make cultural life more vibrant right. and, and, and more rich. Let me bring in Adaf Suef and, and ask when you were in Egypt recently and you were uh, there taking part in the protest in Tahrir Square against the Egyptian uh, President uh, Mubarak's regime. Uh, what, what sense did you get of what people wanted? I mean, of course, people are very concerned about the economic disparity in, in a place like Egypt, but how, how, how high on the list of priorities was, for example, the, the freedom of expression and the chance to change some cultural norms? Well, I agree completely with what Hashem has just said. What I saw happening was exactly a people rediscovering themselves, rediscovering what it meant to be Egyptian and celebrating that. And over the three weeks, Tahrir Square very, very quickly became the civic space that we all long for and that we all feel that we deserve. And this was manifested in all sorts of ways, including that uh, it was this great burst of creative energy, which um, showed itself in people uh, creating art. There was street art, there were stand-up comics, there were, of course, all the slogans and the placards that people were inventing and carrying around. Um, there were the jokes, there were the songs, the chants. There was a huge burst of expression, which was creative, innovative, um, humorous, and 
um, that that people were celebrating as it was happening. They so were discovering so what it was like. Right. I wonder to then be able uh, to uh, speak. Hadaf, I wonder if, if then that, that sort of that that uh, rich cultural heritage that Egypt had has not been crushed or destroyed over time. Then is it still you still feel it's vibrant? Well, you know what? For years, um, I and many others have been holding on to a position that looked impossibly romantic, which basically can be summarized as we have developed an Egyptian character over 7,000 years. The fact that it has been so sort of rubbished for 40 years can't matter. It is there somewhere. And at some point, we're going to shake off all this dust and debris, and it will shine forth again. And this is what happened in, in, in this revolution. Now, Ariel Dorfman, it's great to have you on the show as well. A pleasure and honor that you could join us, sir. And I wonder, it's not obviously, it's not only in the Middle East that writers and, and uh, intellectuals and artists have felt the heavy hand of oppression by authoritarian regimes. And I wonder, you know, it's happened all over the world. How do you compare the situation that you're seeing in the turbulent countries of the Arab world right now with what you witnessed yourself in your home country, Chile, where, of course, you eventually had to flee into exile because well, of the uh, well, Pinochet regime? You know, the first thing that, that, that you feel uh, is this enormous joy to see that, that the Egyptians and the Tunisians and the Libyans are Chileans as well. And when, when, when you, I think the, the, the extraordinary thing that you're, you're, you're hearing here is voice. There are many voices that were there, but they were suppressed. They weren't finding each other. They were, now, now they're able to echo, now they're able to, to go forth. In my case, uh, I lived three very different experiences. I lived a revolution with Salvador Allende for three years. I lived 17 years of oppression and, and persecution under the dictatorship. And then I lived what now the Egyptians and the Tunisians and others are, are starting to, to look at, which is the transition to democracy, which is the most complicated of all these, both for the people, for the politics, for the army, but especially for the writers and for the, the artists. So there are many different ways in which uh, artists participate according to what the tasks of the revolution or the repression or the transition may be. But these are, 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 are not always the same sort of thing that you do. In other words, I, I can't write Death in the Maiden uh, when I'm with Allende's, uh, because people aren't being tortured there, right? right. So I, I wrote it for the transition. Yeah, so I think that one of the interesting things that we have to understand is that that there is not one voice only coming out of this, only one way in which you react to this, but that writers especially and artists react in different ways and have different tasks, often simultaneously, uh, during these periods of repression, of transition, of revolution. And, and, and Ariel, I, I know that uh, you know, writers and, and intellectuals, and it's that, that sort of uh, element of society that's often preemptively targeted by authorita authoritarian regimes when they come into power. They seem to, to go straight for them in the first instance. What do you think is the immediate threat? Well, the, the, the immediate threat is that if you allow anybody to speak out, if you allow anybody, I mean, the, the one thing that art has, especially in countries such as Egypt, Libya, Chile, is that it's always transgressive. Even when it's a love poem, it's transgressive. Because you're expressing truth. And these are regimes that are based upon lies. They're based upon hiding from each other and from the people the truth of what's happening. So because artists tend to, uh, I think what, that what artists always do and writers always do is in some sense, in the joy of our own writing and the expression, we are calling into being the society of freedom and of communication, right. uh, some sort of a utopian society that will be in the future. So we are really very, very dangerous. We're right. dangerous as symbols. We're dangerous as expressive voices. Hisham Atta, let me ask you, you had personal experience of living you know, with the secret police and living under the regime of, uh, of uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Give us some idea of what, what you really experienced in terms of how repressive it was. Well, our you mean you mean our my family. personal experience, or you mean yourself the family and, experience? Yourself and your well, family. It of was course, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we left Libya in uh, the late '70s. When uh, I mean, if you were to choose, uh, you know, one of the important years uh, under the Gaddafi regime it was '79, because many writers were imprisoned then. It was a great crackdown on civil society. Books were burnt. We left that year and we went to Egypt, and uh, it wasn't until uh, 10 years later that my father was kidnapped. And during those 10 years, we were sort of sandwiched between two dictatorships, between the Egyptian and the Libyan. And so we, were, we, had, security, we had security guards g supposed to be guarding us, but actually, as it turns out, they were 
they were sort of um, monitoring us, Egyptian security guards. Uh, and in the end, it was actually the Egyptian Secret Service that handed my father over to, mm -hmm. to Libya. But I mean, this is a particular story. This is our particular story. I don't think it's as, 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 as relevant right now or as, as, as interesting right now as general life in, in Libya. I mean, there are people that went through much worse things than mm -hmm. that. Let me, um, um, you know, uh, summary execution and disappearances under Gaddafi were were, um, you know, uh, a very common thing. Let me bring in a, a caller we've got on the line from uh, Virginia. Oliver, thanks for being with us. What would you like to ask? Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, I have a couple questions. The first one is, is the substance of the word that uh, activate these demonstrations or the repetition? Because from history, uh, we learned that uh, the, the German people went with Adolf Hitler despite all the atrocities that he did uh, to the end, until, until, until the end. So that's my question. Is there a petition or, or the substance? And the second question is, if, the, if these uh, uh, autocratic regimes in the Middle East and Northern Africa start collapsing one after another, is this going to affect the intelligence sharing between the Western intelligence agencies and uh, their intelligence agencies? Is going to affect the war on terror negatively? Ah, interesting. On okay. the West? Well, uh, uh, Oliver, let me put the first part to Ariel Dorfman and, and ask about that. Is it the, the repetition of the phrase or the actual content that allows someone to be so convincing? when it comes to using words? Well, you know, uh, th I think that the use of those words by these totalitarian regimes uh, is not only in the incantation of the word itself, but it has to do with the fertile ground where it happens. Uh, there, are, there is, for instance, a, a great deal of desire for security and stability, and that's what dictators play to all the time. They always play with fear. So I don't think it's only the repetition of the words. What, what's nice about, about art is that art doesn't repeat words. It, it, it invents words constantly. It's always imagining a different parallel reality. And that's where its enormous strength comes from. And that's where I think also we have this, uh, this, this tremendous pressure on artists. That's why artists are always exiled. They're jailed, uh, as many other people are. I mean, we, our Libyan friends certainly explain that very, very clearly. Uh, very often, artists, in fact, they, they're, they're persecuted, but very often, at least we know about their fate. We don't know about the fate about uh, the peasants and the workers and, and the students. They're just thrown away and neglected and forgotten. And very often the writer becomes the person who can write about that, can tell those stories. We're really storytellers. And I think all three of us have lived that experience of the extraordinary strength of the story that is told. And that story is told, uh, either it's told or retold. And that is a repetition, which is much stronger than the, in the incantation, mm -hmm. the enchantment of a Hitler or of a, of a Gaddafi. Well, uh, Ahdas uh, Suef, let me ask you to take the second part of Oliver's question, the issue of whether or not you think there might be a better or, or worse cooperation between the East and the West now that we're seeing the change in the Arab regimes, especially when it comes to the, the so-called war on terror. Well, I think what I'd like to do is unpackage the question. Uh, he uses the terms the war on terror, and then he talks about intelligence sharing. So first of all, what is exactly this war on terror? I think that's a big question, and everybody would agree on that. And then intelligence sharing. Now, if we look at an aspect of the cooperation between Egypt and the West, specifically the United States, um, in the so-called war on terror, we come up with extraordinary rendition. So basically, Egypt, uh, you know, becoming a, a place of choice for prisoners flown over from the United States to be tortured. Um, I would hope that these practices would completely end. Um, and I think that this is a large part of what the Egyptian people want, that their country should stop being used to implement strategies and to implement policies that are inimical to the region, to the country, and to our moral and social well-being. Because, mm -hmm. of course, if you, if you become a center for torture at the behest of the United States, then the filter down effect means that you torture becomes endemic and systemic in society, which is what we have experienced. Well, and, uh, and so I think this whole thing of cooperation in the war on terror is going to need to be rethought. Well, Adaf, I want to put to you a couple of emails that we got, uh, your impression or comments made by a couple of emails that we received. I'm going to put, read them back to back to you. The first one's from a viewer by the name of Hazam Baloch, who says, the words of writers and poets acts as, uh, act as a mirror to their societies. They are bound to write on the problems of society to free people from stagnation. The second email comes from the USA, from Ahmed Abdullah uh, in Nebraska, who says, 
In the colonial era, poets and intellectuals inspired people to liberate their countries from oppression. No revolution can truly succeed without the intellectual elite. Now, I wonder, do you think it's, uh, it's that, that power of inspiration uh, that, was, uh, that, that threatens oppressive regimes? Well, I think that what, I mean, I think different arts or even different literary arts have different functions. And it's, uh, it's much easier to see the function of poetry in uh, revolution and in rousing revolutions than it is, for example, to see fiction. But what fiction does as well, I think, is it, it keeps certain ideas alive and it therefore keeps the ground fertile for uh, revolutionary thoughts to, to, to take root. And I think that something that's really important in, in a revolution, and we saw it very much in the Egyptian revolution, is that people need to feel that they're not alone. And I think that it was that impetus when people came out on the streets and sort of recognized each other um, and recognized that other people were coming out and so on that, that it, it all grew. And I think that, that art and fiction specifically do that. They, uh, you read a passage and you recognize yourself in it and you know that you're not alone and you know that lots of other people are seeing and feeling the same thing. And it is, I think, in that sense that um, that it helps big, big social movements along. Hisham uh, 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 Matar, I want to get to you uh, an email question, if I may, that came in from uh, Uganda, from Kampala. Uh, Moses Smith wrote in saying, communication is only possible with a uh, unifying language. The revolutions of North Africa were achieved through these people's cultural common denominator, Arabic. Do you believe that's the case, that having a common language across all these countries has helped the so-called domino effect that's taken place across the Arab world? Well, perhaps. I mean, I think also culturally, uh, maybe the more, I mean, that's definitely a big part of it is the language, but also more significantly, I think the, the culture and the experience of the political experience in the Middle East has a lot of, shares a lot of things in common. I am, though, slightly um, wary of the view that somehow writers are, you know, fundamentally Im useful to a revolution. I think we serve a, a function just like a just like a baker serves a function in a revolution. I don't think we're more important than that. Maybe even we're less important, far less important than a baker. Uh, and I see now in the Libyan revolution, it's a revolution that doesn't necessarily need writers. I, I feel, as a writer, I feel particularly useless uh, during the, during the revolution. And I'm also, I think also wary of the opposing kind of uh, view that is uh, often romanticized in the West about sort of the writer under oppression and how somehow that state can, you know, inspire deep and incredibly good, urgent works, you know. I think, you know, I don't see any evidence for that. I see evidence that oppression um, stifles literature, it stifles thought, it stifles education and intellectual discourse. And I think also it does it for a very sim for for the same reason that Ariel Dorfman said earlier on that writers do in some way exist against oppression that mm -hmm. you know literature by its nature is rebellious and it 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 it, it is interested in 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 the multiplicity of life and in trying to understand and know the other and uh, it is filled with opposing currents of empathy and so that you know uh, uh, doesn't uh, you know uh, flourish right. under under uh, an oppressive regime let's get let's get uh, ariel dorfman's uh, um, impression on this and no, also i can put it in I, terms I, of a i can well, i was going to put it in terms of a question to you as well because it touches on this yes, issue that please. that's been raised it came from kenya from a viewer by the name of max kabuya in otaya in kenya who says Revolution requires a common mindset to unite the people of a country. Intellectuals must help in creating this space by feeding the hearts and minds of people with nobler aspirations. So uh, listening to what well, uh, Hisham I, had to say, I wonder what your view is. I worry, about, I worry about the word must, always, because must is, is the word that people like Gaddafi use. The you must do this, you must do that. No, mm. I, I think, look, I had the following experience. When I was during the three years of Allende, I was very often very doubtful about what literature was actually accomplishing because there was so much being baked, to use the, the, the metaphor we've, we, we've just used. There's so much being baked. There was so much bread in the air. Uh, it then became really important to me when, when there was this persecution and we were in exile 
and we were clandestinely making manuscripts go through. And there was a sense of, well, we're going to denounce the regime, but we're also going to try to understand what's happening. We're going to try to create a world and understand that world there. And I think, personally, that the most important thing that literature really does, it doesn't create noble aspirations. It is noble in itself, but it, in fact, it often can t tell us about the worst things in human beings. And that's not a bad thing for, for us to be able to do as well. The humans in all their flaws, to know these things. I think that literature becomes particularly important now, at moments of transition, because that's the moment when there's a great deal of confusion. And literature, I think, can, can help not to create more confusion, but to create a language which is common to the understanding of the complexity of the situation. The situations in these countries that are uh, undergoing these uprisings and the, these changes is incredibly complex with enormous amounts of different energies coming from different places. People have never had this experience before. And I think this is the moment when literature becomes crucial to the mind of the country. But that mind is not one mind. Okay. It is, in fact, made out of many different currents and energies. Well, and I think that's where it really comes from. Well, let's get Jack in on the line from Rome. Jack, thanks for your patience. What would you like to ask? Okay, first of all, I want to congratulate you and Al Jazeera because your coverage of the complete Middle East and North Africa made everything possible. Like, you change history, your channel. You, you. you yourself have picked wonderful topics. These three beautiful people that you are interviewing, literature is right, but with their knowledge and their ability, they should be writing, like, uh, editorials to newspapers because everything is happening so fast that if they start and other writers start flooding the the, the uh, discussions, the letters to the editors, the articles right. to the newspapers, on their thoughts of freedom shortly and, you know, concise, published tomorrow, they're going to make a wonderful difference in the outcome of this event. Well, Jack, you, you, uh, Jack I, you, you raise an interesting point, which I want to actually uh, put to Hadaf Suef, which comes actually in the form of an email, too, from uh, Canada, uh, from Sumaya Verji, who wrote in saying... Who are the Mills, Locks, and Marxes of today? Do modern intellectuals really mean anything to us anymore? Facebook pictures and Twitter lines are far better ways of informing viewers, uh, sorry, informing ourselves about our governments than cracking open a book. So I wonder to what degree you feel that uh, modern, uh, the new media has replaced the traditional way of commuting, communicating uh, ideology. Well, you know, I think everything has its place. I mean, obviously, the new media is tremendously important, is crucial, is critical, um, and is playing an immediate role in everything that is happening. Um, I think people who work in the old media and who write novels or long books, um, there's a challenge. And if they have some, something to say, then they, they sit there and they try and craft it. And then it's up to the readers to decide whether whether they've got something to say that's new. But what I do know, and what I have seen over the last three weeks in, uh, in Egypt, in Tahrir Square and elsewhere, is that there is a tremendous will to contribute, and a tremendous will to, to be the best one can, and to do the best one can. And it's as if everybody is reaching out for whatever good thing they have, and, and throwing it into the situation, as though so to tip the scales in, in, you know, towards, towards good. Um, and that's what we all feel now, and each one will do what they can, you know, with whatever media, whatever tool that they have. Right. Hisham, just 20 seconds to go. A quick thought on the way new media has been so significant in this, in, in, in the whole system. Just a quick thought. Oh, it, it, it's signi uh, ver very significant. You know, people think that uh, this is the first time that Gaddafi bombed and shot his people indiscriminately. He did something very similar in the early 90s in, in Derna, but there were no mobile phones, uh, right. no images being you know, sent abroad. So nobody knew about that then. It wasn't okay. even reported on in the Arab world. So yeah, very significant, I well, think. Well, unfortunately, because we have so little time. I, I want to thank you all for taking part in this very fascinating debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Remember, you can watch a podcast of the shows on iTunes. We're currently featuring our conversation about Pakistan's controversial blasphemy laws with leading figures from the region. On the next show, Revolution Through Music, rock star and activist Yusuf Islam, formerly known as Cat Stevens, reveals the origins of his new song celebrating the popular uprisings in Egypt and beyond. We explore how musicians can get involved in the demand for democratic reforms across the Arab world. Be sure to tune in for that from me and the team. We'll see you next time.